Welcome back to the channel. It's been a minute since I made an episode related to the Kristen Smart case. You can find a playlist for Kristen's case on the channel. I covered the trial and other tidbits, especially from a local's perspective. Kristen, of course, is a missing, murdered, former Cal Poly student. She has a special place in my heart. And locals here where she was murdered continue to search, pray, and keep hope alive. We get together to remember her on her birthday, other occasions related to Kristen, at Kristen's Point in Shell Beach. At Muir Hall, her former dorm at Cal Poly. We do fundraisers in her memory for her search and ongoing legal fees. The Smart family has sued Cal Poly and the murderer's family. Not only for accountability, but for future safety of others. I've been covering her case and will continue to do updates. This episode is an update on the convicted killer, Paul Flores. We have an update as of June 11th, 2024, and a quick timeline review of how it's been going for him. Before the update and the timeline, I want to remind everybody of a few important things. Since Paul's conviction of murder during commission of an RAPE, YouTube's already going to block this because the words that are used in this, but I at least want to cover it. She deserves the coverage, and she gets so, so little. Paul, a.k.a. Chester the Molester, as he was nicknamed during his time at Cal Poly, sexually assaulted others, and Los Angeles is going to do nothing about it, even though there's DNA, there's videos of the assault, and the creep even had child porn, but no charges. Go figure. Never heard of such a thing. He's gotten away with so, so much. He's finally locked up for what he did to Kristen, but it took over 25 years, and during that time, he hurt a lot of other people. He's so frickin' dangerous. All right, let's do the timeline. August 18th, 2023, coverage shows that Paul was moved to Coalinga Prison after being sorted for placement. He was attacked his first day in general population. He is a high-profile prisoner and considered a target and a prize. September 28th of 2023, he made his first court appearance since his attack. His throat was slashed in the attack. The court's still holding hearings because restitution is still being sorted out since his conviction. As a matter of fact, today, June 12th, Paul was at the hearing via Zoom. Here's what he looked like, and Kristen's family spoke at the hearing as well. In October, more details were released about Paul's attacker. He has a history of attacking high-profile prisoners. He previously attacked the I-5 Strangler, and I already did several separate episodes regarding all that. And Paul's attacker, in that case, pled not guilty. By April of 2024, Paul was attacked again. I did a one-minute update video on that with very little detail because there wasn't much. There'll be more details in this episode. But the attack happened in the yard again. And I remember when we toured Alcatraz where they pointed out that the yard is the most dangerous place at a prison. I did not do a separate episode on the second attack because I was waiting to see if he was moved or killed first. Here's the details on attack number two. The second attack was within seven months of the first. And because of that, Paul could be transferred according to the CDCR criteria. Because he, quote, can't safely function. Poor baby. Attempted murders are not common at Pleasant Valley State Prison. I always laugh at the name for such a non-pleasant place. There was only 21 attempted murders there in 2023 and 198 statewide. January through March of 2024, the count is at five for Pleasant Valley State Prison's attempted murders. Of course, same as Paul's first attacker, the second one also has a history of attacking others. Does anyone besides me feel like some of the commingling of known prison attackers with high-profile targets is not accidental? Let me know in the comments. Here's Danny, Paul's second attacker. According to the prison records, 
on 41024, prison staff admittedly put Paul and Danny, along with other inmates, together in the yard. Danny went for Paul with a shank in each hand. Everyone was ordered to the ground and medical staff was called. Danny had bloody hands and bloody clothes. His two shanks were found in the dirt. Paul's attacker is in there for a six-year sentence for robbery. What an idiot. He's been in prison since September 27, 2017. He's been charged four times since while incarcerated, twice for having weapons and twice for assault while at Kern County prisons, according to court records. Paul was once again rushed to the hospital. Upon his return, he was placed in a protective housing unit during a review of his future placement. That process, they said at the time, could take 60 days. The last dude went for his throat, and this guy stabbed him in the torso, apparently. Paul has to find a home because his sentence is 25 to life. Speaking of which, I wonder how many years his second attacker has added to his original six years, considering he now has five charges that he tacked on while in prison. Not very smart, I'd say, in my opinion. Here's a comment sharing my suspicions on how and why Paul and Danny were quote, playing together in the yard. This comment wants to reward Danny for trying to get Paul. Just a dad asks Paul how it feels to be continually attacked like you did to your other victims. Like I said, Kristen was not the first victim of Paul or the last, but she is the reason the monster is finally in a cage. We were headed to Kohlinga in the fall, part of our six-week road trip. Watch for that on the channel. It will be epic. But I guess we won't get to see Paul now. Just kidding. Back to the timeline. April 17th, 2024, Paul was still in review to be moved. And just yesterday, June 11th, 2024, he was actually moved over safety concerns. He was moved to Corcoran State Prison on June 6th, 2024. The prison... Statement claims safety and security of people who live and work there is CDCR's top priority. <clears throat> Paul was convicted for murdering Kristen October of 2022. He took her life in 1996. He was in jail during the trial. Bye, Felicia. Just like the last sentence reminds us here, Kristen has still not been found. As we end this episode, let's go out the same way we started, remembering Kristen, the victim, the young lady who had so much to offer but never got a chance. Her life was stolen. She was not Paul's first victim, nor his last. And now he finally gets a taste of being the prey, the hunted, fearing for his life. No sense of safety. Kristen was a real person, a quirky, ambitious, loving girl. She had friends and family who have aching hearts without her. She was brave, adventurous, and unique. I pray for the day that she is found and returned to her loved ones. I just learned some more details about the restitution hearing held today, June 12, 2024. Kristen's family was required to provide an itemized expense list dating all the way back to 1996. Oh, the trauma. California court requires the convicted to compensate victims... The order is set regardless of the defendant's ability to pay. The Department of Corrections will collect 50% of prison wages, deposits, and or trust to eventually pay restitution full. Voluntary payments can also be made. Any unpaid after the release from prison is referred to the California Franchise Tax Board. Kristen's mother, Denise, said, quote, I'm struggling measuring our financial loss when the emotional toll is so great, end quote. At today's hearing, she said that amongst other things. The total requested is $361,000 submitted by five family members. They said these numbers are conservative, and Denise pointed out that no one ever told them to keep receipts, so documentation is limited. National averages for gas and hotels were used for each year. Denise also said, quote, it's demeaning to Kristen's memory to measure our loss in finances, end quote. She told the local news, adding, quote, our loss is Kristen, end quote. The defense declined the family's offer to drop restitution in exchange for info leading to Kristen's body. 
that just makes my blood boil. The defense, who is Harold Misick, by the way, as you recall, he defended Paul's father, Reuben, in the accessory trial. The defense questioned lost wages and other expenses. Kristen's family reminded the court they were away from home over 237 days for the trial alone. There was a stay for the 25th anniversary of Kristen's death that was also questioned as voluntary. Kristen's sister was challenged that she used paid time off, and she said it was for vacation, not to spend time where her sister was murdered, and that she could not get that money back from her company. Kristen's brother, Matt, was also grilled on money owed to him. He said they did not choose this, and Kristen was the greatest loss. Denise was forced to retire early in 2020, and Kristen's dad was asking for over $150,000, mostly for all the years of travel expenses. Stan, Kristen's dad, spoke on how this has changed the entire family, and it's not a normal situation. Monterey County Judge O'Keefe will have a ruling on Monday, June 17, 2024, at 10 a.m. regarding restitution. 47-year-old Paul Flores is eligible for parole in the year 2037, which just absolutely blows my mind. I hope he doesn't get out. And of course, there's still appeals we have to deal with. Hashtag find Kristen Smart.